It's tattoos, athletes, copyright, and other problems. And on our panel today, we have Bill McGrath of Davis McGrath and the John Marshall Law School and Edward Grahoviak of Go Empire to talk about these issues. And I'm Bill Ford of the John Marshall Law School. Uh, I do have a few handouts that I'll pass out once I turn things over to Bill. Um, here's how we're going to do this. Uh, Bill's going to talk about the copyright issues. Then Ed's going to talk about some of the practical problems that come up as a sports agent. And then we'll take Q&A on the copyright issues, and then we'll switch gears and talk about a couple of other topics that will tie into this one involving the right of publicity and false endorsement. And at least in the area of false endorsement, there's at least a pending case to make things somewhat interesting. So at this time, I will turn it over to Bill McGrath. He's going to focus on what is, I think, the first significant case to raise these issues, and it's not a video game case. It's not one of these, but it raises the same sort of issues. And while you're doing that, I'm going to pass out the handouts that will aid people in following along. Okay, and I should just stay here. Yeah, I'll just stay here. <clears throat> well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here uh, this afternoon to talk about tattoos. Uh, disclaimer, I uh, don't normally play video games and I don't have any tattoos, so. But I have taught copyright law for a long time over at John Marshall and I've been practicing copyright law for a long time, even before that. So, um, uh, anyway, so I'm gonna yeah, get us started by just laying a little uh, groundwork on the, the first aspect of our panel here today, which is the copyright treatment of tattoo issues. Um, these have been cropping up more commonly now, uh, it, it seems, several cases um, involving tattoo artists asserting copyright rights in their tattoos, in their tattoo designs, and they're arising in different contexts, and uh, I'll talk um, as, as Bill Ford said about what was probably the thing that got the ball rolling here in terms of tattoos and copyrights. Um, the main issue that, that we, I want to think about today or, or have you think about a little bit is the question of, is a tattoo copyrightable? Now, just, uh, I know some of you maybe aren't lawyers. Uh, um, some of you may have differing degrees of copyright knowledge. So I'll just real quickly cover a couple basics. So copyrights, as distinguished from patents and trademarks, people tend to lump those together. Copyrights are for works of authorship in whatever form, written form, uh, literary works, musical works, uh, audiovisual works like a movie. Um, importantly for our purposes, pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works. Uh, you know, so pretty much any kind of pictorial work um, can be protected by copyright. So, uh, so the question is, you know, what is copyright subject matter? What is it that the copyright law protects? And then once you've looked at that, the, the second question in any copyright dispute has to be, well, what, what rights does a copyright owner have. And there are basically, you're, there's, there's a, uh, uh, several different rights that the copyright law provides to the copyright owner, the creator of the work. And the main one being the, the right to reproduce. Uh, these rights are exclusive to the copyright owner. So in other words, the copyright owner has the sole and exclusive right to reproduce the copyrighted work, whether publishing a novel or making a prints of a, of a pictorial graphic work or whatever. So that's the, one of the key rights uh, is, is the, the right to reproduce. But there's other rights as well, such as the right to publicly distribute the work, uh, the right to create a derivative work, which is just like a modification or a sequel or, or some form or fashion that's derived from uh, another original work. And then there's the right of public performance that comes into play with music and the right of public display. Um, 
So those that, that's your so you have two th concepts: the subject matter and the exclusive rights that are involved. Now, with tattoos, uh, the main question that has come up is, is a tattoo copyrightable? Uh, and to answer that, we have to um, look at the, the section of the Copyright Act that talks about copyright subject matter. And it's very simple. It, it says, and there's a, it's just one, one statement, there's a couple different elements. In order to have a copyright matter, there has to be a work of authorship, uh, an original work of authorship, not any work of authorship, but it has to be original. So it has to be an original work of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So in that statement, you've got three different concepts, really. One is originality, uh, one is a work of authorship, and one is this notion of fixation. Um, now, when the Copyright Act talks about originality, what they mean there is it's, it's not the author, the, the creator of the work didn't copy it from somewhere else. Um, it, ha it has to be coming from the, from the creator or the author uh, himself or herself. And in addition to that, there has to be at least some minimal degree of creativity involved. So if there's no real creativity, uh, you know, the copyright law isn't going to uh, give copyright protection then to something that is totally commonplace and mundane and, and copied from someone else. Um, all right, so that's originality. And that, that can be a very complicated question. The courts have, uh, you know, lots of disputes over whether something meets the minimal degree of creativity for protection under copyright and, and things like that. The other uh, uh, factor is, is it a work of authorship? And I mentioned some of the works of authorship uh, already, and what we're dealing with here are pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works. So you, clearly you can see, theoretically, a tattoo uh, or I won't say all tattoos, but I would say many tattoos would consist of a um, pictorial, graphic, or sculptural work. Um, okay, and then the third uh, element is fixation. Um, copyright protection only adheres to a work that is somehow in fixed, tangible form. Um, if a, a comedian or a, a politician gets up and gives uh, an, an impromptu, improvised uh, talk or skit or something like that, but it's never been written down, it's not being recorded, nobody's taping it or anything, it just floats away with the wind, that's not protectable by copyright because it hasn't been fixed. So if you're going to have a legal right, kind of the thinking is, uh, you better have something that's fixed so that there's no disputes about what was the work. I remember somebody, you know, gave a talk, you know, five years ago, and he said this, and he's, now he's claiming copyright in it. Well, if it's not fixed, if it's not tangible in some way, there's no copyright protection. So keep those real basic concepts in mind as we talk about this case that was really one of the first that, that dealt substantively with the question of uh, is a copyright, is a, a tattoo protectable? Is it copyrightable? And even to this day, uh, while there have been, you know, some lawsuits filed and so forth, uh, there, we don't have a lot of court decisions articulating uh, any, any rulings or reasoning. There is one ruling in this case I'm about to talk to, but there's no long written opinion by the court as to you know, how the court came to its conclusion. Um, and the case I'm talking about uh, is called uh, the, the artist, the tattoo artist involved was a fellow by the name of Victor Whitmill. Uh, and he sued Warner Brothers. Some of you may remember this suit or be familiar with it. Uh, I am sure you all remember the movie that was involved, which is Hangover 2. 
Um, this is going back, I think, into 2011 or so. Uh, Hangover 2 was, a, was about to uh, have its uh, blockbuster debut. Uh, Hangover 1 was a hu huge success. So, of course, there had to be a, block, or a uh, Hangover 2. It was about to come out on Memorial Day back in, as I say, I think 2011. When, um, and, and, you know, movie producers are always have to be very careful about clearing all the rights to any kind of copyrightable content that appear in their movies. If they don't, they end up getting sued by copyright owners. So Warner Brothers uh, talked with Mike Tyson. Actually, Mike Tyson appeared in the uh, video. He was a, a prominent figure in this lawsuit. Um, uh, because this involved the, the tattoo that is on Mike Tyson's face. You may recall seeing that. Um, and they contacted Tyson and said, oh, you know, we want to be make sure you're okay with us using you and your tattoo. The tattoo figures very importantly in the movie because if you understand the premise of hangover movies, guys get drunk and then things happen after that. So in this particular uh, episode, Ed Helms, who used to be in the office, very funny guy, he gets drunk and he wakes up one morning and he's got a tattoo on his face and it is the same tattoo as Mike Tyson's tattoo. And all kinds of hilarity ensues after that. But um, now, although the Warner Brothers cleared everything with Mike Tyson, they did not clear it with Victor Whitmill who created the design and was the tattoo artist. Um, now, another thing I should mention, backing up to fundamentals, who is the person who owns the copyright? It's the creator of the work. So in this case, Victor Whitmill created the pictorial graphic work. The fact that it's on Mike Tyson's face doesn't make Mike Tyson the owner of the copyright. He didn't create it. Um, and there was uh, actually a, some written contract where Victor Whitmill had Mike Tyson agree that all the rights to the pictorial graphic work were owned by Mr. Whitmill. All right, so Memorial Day, the blockbuster is about to come out, and I don't know, a week or two before that, Whitmill files a lawsuit down in St. Louis trying to get an injunction, a preliminary injunction, to stop the movie from being presented on the grounds that they've infringed his copyright. Um, and that's what the case w was all about. Uh, Warner Brothers had already spent $77 million uh, promoting the movie, and so that all had to be taken into consideration by the judge as to where the balance of hardships would fall. But anyway, I want to focus mainly, uh, uh, let me... Uh, spoiler alert, the judge uh, refused to grant a preliminary injunction. So the movie was allowed to open up. Um, but um, there, there's more on that. Um, in any event, I want to focus on what the merits of the case were. Um, and, and by focusing on what the defendant's arguments were. I mean, if you start with uh, the basic prima facie case, the plaintiff uh, had created the design, though well, there were some arguments about whether it was original or he copied it from a Maori tribe or something like that, but that wasn't pressed too hard. But uh, basically, the, the plaintiff showed he created it, he had ownership of the copyright, uh, and that it had been reproduced and that they never got permission from him. Um, so how did the defendants uh, try to argue against this? Um, well, let me just uh, uh, focus on some of the main points that they made in the brief. The, the defendants um, took the position that a tattoo is not copyrightable. And the particular reason they, they had was that uh, uh, 
you know, this is not a proper medium of expression. They were going for that third prong, that it has to be fixed in a tangible medium of expression. And they were taking the position that uh, a human face is not the type of tangible medium of expression uh, that the copyright law was envisioning. Uh, in short, they say the human flesh in which Whitmill inscribed his artistic efforts cannot support copyright infringement or copyright protection. Um, uh, they basically came up with a parade of horribles that would happen if, if we were to give copyright protection to things like tattoos. I don't want to go into all the details here. Um, but I, I will mention in, you know, so Warner Brothers had lots of resources at its, uh, at its fingertips. One of the things they did was to retain as an expert witness um, a fellow named David Nimmer. Now David Nimmer is the uh, co-author of what is probably the most famous of all or copyright treatises. It's called Nimmer on Copyright. And he's a very authoritative figure. Nimmer's, Nimmer's treatise is cited more in copyright cases than any other copyright treatise. Okay, and so David Nimmer comes out and files a de declaration and, and he's providing the legal support, his, his arguments as this copyright expert of why tattoos uh, are not copyrightable. Because they're not, you know, the human flesh, someone's head or face, you know, cannot be the type of medium of expression. Now, there was just one problem when he filed that, which is, in his treatise, and you'll see where I'm going here, in his treatise, in footnote 392, <laughs> he took the position that, I want to find the exact language here, uh, for a tattoo may presumably qualify as a work of graphic art, regardless of the medium in which it is designed to be effect, affixed. In this instance, human flesh. So, uh, there he had a little problem, and in his declaration, he acknowledges that he said that, of course he had to, and, and with some very lawyerly, oh, I was thinking about this for a long time, and I've come to see the light, and so forth, uh, a lot of backpedaling, and, 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 and in fact, actually changed the footnote after that, or simultaneously with all this, to take out the words tattoo and take out the comment about human flesh. And so now the, ta the, the footnote, if you read it, just kind of a generic footnote about pictorial works. So um, anyway, that was an interesting aspect of, of the case. Um, so they also argued in this case that uh, it was a fair use. You've probably heard of the fair use doctrine and uh, this allows unlicensed uses um, if you meet various factors, if it's not for commercial purposes, if not too much of the original has been taken, uh, and, and if it's not going to have any effect on the market. So they argued it was a parody type fair use. Um, the problem there is this was highly commercial, and that, that is a significant factor. So. But, you know, it was an argument. And then their, their third argument they made is, is that uh, there would have been an implied license here to, to use this tattoo. It's on Mike Tyson's face. You know, he's a, a human. He does things that, you know, the artist must have known he would be using his face and this tattoo for commercial purposes. Uh, and that's not a, a, an unreasonable argument. I don't know how they felt it stretched to putting the tattoo on Ed Helms's face as opposed to just showing um, Mike Tyson's face. Where this is coming up, the same kind of thing is now, and my colleagues will talk about this more too, is so in, in the video game world, 
There are video games out there. They have LeBron James. They have whoever, Colin Kaepernick, whoever is in the video game. Um, they're putting their tattoos in as well. And so is that kosher or is that going to be a problem? Um, now, so uh, let me just tell you, though, what the, what the court said. The court, um, as I said, denied a preliminary injunction, said the movie could go forward because of the harm to Warner Brothers. But there's another part of a preliminary injunction that a court always has to consider, which is the likelihood of success on the merits of the case. And on that, even though she ruled the other way on the ultimate outcome, the judge was very clear that she, uh, she said, that, you know, of course tattoos are copyrightable. And she characterized the defendant's arguments about, you know, its flesh and so forth. She characterized those as silly. Uh, now, there's no big written opinion on, on this. She just announced her, her decision orally. Um, but, um, you know, those comments that she made were recorded. And, and so um, they're probably not worth any real precedential value, but it does give you a sense of what she thought about Warner Brothers' arguments and Professor Nimmer's arguments in that regard. Uh, so with that, I will, well, I guess first, the que uh, if there's any questions about the copyright issues, um, we can take those now, and then we'll move on to rights of publicity and so well, forth. Or, or whatever. And I, well, kind of, actually, before go ahead. we do that, I, I want to st stick with sure. the copyright if we can talk about some of the practical issues, because sure. in the Hangover film, you have the, the person who's not as closely associated with the tattoo getting the tattoo. But about a year after the litigation involving the hangover, what do you get? Well, now you get cases involving video games. About a year later, you get a case called Escobedo, which involves this game here. If you can't see it, it's UFC Undisputed 3, because the plaintiff said, you've got a participant in the game here based on a real-world mixed martial artist who has a tattoo. The plaintiff says, I'm the copyright owner, and then sues THQ because the person is depicted in the game with the tattoo. And then shortly after that, you get this one, Williams versus Electronic Arts, again saying you've got the player in the game, you're showing the tattoo, I'm the copyright owner, it's not the player who's the copyright owner, you've infringed the copyright. Now what's interesting about this case, and I'll be interested to hear your thoughts on this, is that in this case, the one involving Williams, something happens that's different from the other cases. The plaintiff sues the athlete. Now in this case, the athlete didn't get sued. In the hangover case, the athlete didn't get sued. In fact, the plaintiff, if you read through the transcript, the, the, the plaintiff uh, is making clear, Mike Tyson's great. I have no problem with Mike Tyson. If Mike Tyson wants to be in the game with the tattoo, that's fine. I'm good with Mike Tyson. He can be on TV. He can be in films. He can be in video games. My issue is with the movie studio. But in this case, it's actually the athletes who sued, which is not good for business, I wouldn't think, if you're a tattoo artist. You want to maintain the position that I am your friend, athlete. I'm not, I'm not upset with you. It's this other entity over there that I'm upset with. But this case settled with that. Well, it actually didn't settle. It was uh, dismissed uh, by the plaintiff. Um, so that case didn't go anywhere. But we've got one ongoing now involving Take Two and the 2K basketball series. As I said, this case is ongoing. In fact, something was just filed in this case yesterday. So this might be the case where we finally get an answer to the question of whether or not the maker of some form of media puts a real-world person into the media, either in video game form or simply films the person in the movie. <laughs> is there a liability if you accurately depict the person with the athlete? This could be a real problem going forward. So, sure. what are some of the practical concerns? Uh, it sounds like the NFL has been more on top of this than maybe some of the other leagues have at least been worrying about it. But what are your thoughts on the practical issues here in talking to the athletes that you represent? Sure. Um, yeah, my role as an agent is really dealing socially on a day-to-day -day basis with our clients and trying to 
uh, keep their names out of any type of press, really. Even good press at times tends to be bad press. So any any type of press that would you know connect one of our clients to any type of litigation or lawsuit or you know potential of that in the future is damaging. You know, so we do everything we can do to try to keep our clients' names out of any type of spot, spotlight at. Uh, at any point that we can, but I could see, you know, like as we've talked uh, before, that a lot of these situations could become cloudy. I, I don't know if people in the indiv- in the audience have tattoos, but at least to, and I don't either. But a lot of the people that I know that do, a lot of them acquired them when they weren't uh, in their full capacity, so to say. Maybe there was a few drinks or a few drugs or whatever it may be that were in play. So you know, and, and really, I don't ever see any of my clients sitting down to get a tattoo and signing a waiver or release or signing anything indemnifying or giving responsibility to everybody because it's like, well, why would I sign anything? You know, athletes don't like signing anything. Uh, That's just kind of their mindset. So, um, you know, for me, and then also kind of going uh, to what you had mentioned was, yeah, the artists are going to go above and beyond the call of duty for any athlete who could then go and put something on Instagram and say, look at this great new tattoo that I just got from blah, 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 this guy in, you know, Miami, Florida, or whatever it is, because obviously that's really good publicity for um, for the tattoo artist. So um, I and that's why I think even in the last um, two most recent uh, lawsuits, that's why I think we don't see necessarily the athlete getting sued because uh, I think anybody that's surrounded with an athlete, if it's somebody that does their tattoos or somebody that cuts their hair, will do anything they can to keep that relationship. Um, you know, and then I also think that there's an almost um, – uh, untold assumption of well, you know, I'm a lot of my athletes are getting their tattoos for free, but there is an assumption from the tattoo artist that well, you're going to go out and speak on my behalf and tell people like you did on Instagram, word of mouth of oh, that's a really great tattoo. Yeah, my guy down in Miami gave it to me. You should go see him. You know, that person's not going to get the free tattoo, but the artist or if the music musician or the actor or the athlete is always going to get the free you know stuff. So. You know, for me, I, I could see a lot of these issues and in, in kind of how they, um, you know, have reared their heads up. Um, you know, for, for me as an agent, um, we're just trying to clear our clients from any type of, you know, negativity, even if it comes out or if it doesn't. So uh, I am, you know, as an agent would try to put, I can't tell who the plaintiff, who to sue, but I would do everything I could do to not have them, you know, come after my uh, client directly, but even in some of these uh, cases, you know, the athletes are maybe being, you know, come at indirectly, um, which, you know, as an athlete too, you don't want your name in any type of publicity because, you know, I, I've known guys, you know, that play in, you know, many different leagues and their coaches will get on them about little things that they hear about them in the press. So, you know, guys are trying to keep as, you know, clear slate as possible, even if it comes down to, you know, simply a tattoo. Um, but yeah, and then I just go back to, you know, the relationship, uh, you know, with tattoo artist and, uh, basketball player or football player being somewhat sacred. And, you know, the tattoo artist is going to try to, you know, f- make himself, um, you know, as complete as possible and try to, you know, um, even out maybe some of the money that he's losing, but rarely is he going to go after the athlete because that athlete's going to continue to, you know, make him money, even if he loses out on that lawsuit. Again, I don't speak from a legal perspective. I speak, you know, simply from a manager perspective, but, um, you know, we'd work hard to keep our clients away from these situations, but, you know, LeBron James really had nothing to do with that lawsuit. But, you know, again, uh, when we spoke earlier this semester at John Marshall, he was the front of our slide was that he is, you know, the center of this controversy that I'm sure his uh, management team is not happy about that as well. Let me ask you, if you're an athlete and you have an elaborate tattoo that you're enthused about or excited about or take a lot of pride in, um, if the video game publisher says, look, I'm sorry, because you didn't get some paperwork signed that day you went into the tattoo parlor... Uh, we're not going to put the tattoo on you in the game. Sure. Do, you, do you think uh, athletes are likely to care or, I mean, they're likely to be disappointed because, again, that's 
Yeah, I think um, now? I think the athletes would really care, and then I also think the consumer, you know, speaking of the person who's going to buy the game, definitely cares. The, I think everybody wants as realistic and as lifelike of an experience as possible when it comes to games, especially with, you know, how, you know, realistic games have become just in the last three years compared to, you know, what it was even when I grew up, you know, 25 years ago. Um, I think that athletes are going to want to be, you know, viewed almost identically, identical to how they look right now. You know, I mean, LeBron James is going to want every tattoo on that. And I also think the consumer is going to want to demand that type of um, fine detail, you know, for, I mean, these games are 60 bucks, you know, which is a ton of money even today. So I think the consumer are going to want it. And I think the athletes are going to want as, you know, realistic of um, a representation of who they are, uh, even down to, you know, how their hair looks. Now, if the tattoo artist was to go after, say, uh, a broadcaster and say, now that you've got a tattoo, you can't be on ESPN anymore until you get permission from me, or sure. else you're going to get sued for infringement every time you show up. Uh, I can't see a court ever going along with that. It just seems too absurd. They're, the court at that point is going to go with the implied license theory and say, look, the idea that when you walked into the tattoo parlor, you were giving up your ability to go on TV or in a film or something like that is absurd. Uh, so that's not going to go anywhere. So it's not surprising, I think, that the plaintiffs here are choosing to go after the video game manufacturer because then you say to the court, look, the video game publisher isn't just sticking a camera in the direction of somebody and capturing how they look. The video game publisher is deciding how to render the athlete in the game and the video game publisher could leave the tattoo out much more easily then you could leave the tattoo out if Mike Tyson appears in the hangover. I realize you could digitally go in and do it, but uh, that's uh, something you probably wouldn't expect is reasonable. But the, the plaintiffs here, who appear to be, at least in the most recent case, I guess what we might call non-practicing entity, I mean, it's somebody bought up the, the right to the tattoo so that they would then be in a position to go after the video game defendant. I mean, there, it's a smart move to go after the video game publisher because the video game medium is likely to be viewed with less sympathy as a different medium, film or TV or something like that. Uh, any, any questions on, on this? Yeah. Isn't there powerful arguments from, to be made from the perspective of the video game publisher, though? Because as you said, you know, an athlete might be upset that they're portraying a video game with this, you know, this tattoo or this arrangement of tattoos that they've worked a long time on getting isn't in the movie or isn't in the game. And, you know, that's something that, that they consider part of their identity. So wouldn't there be a strong argument from the side of the video game publisher that, look, we get it. We couldn't do the project. We couldn't show it. You know, we couldn't portray this figure without this tattoo. There's no way we could accurately show them because that's considered part of their identity. But now, in, until recently, the resolution of the game would not have been high enough to do it. So they, right. I mean, for many years, you weren't even trying because you couldn't really do it. Now right. that you can do it, you say you must do it. Uh, I mean, I, I think that's a compelling argument. And in fact, the implied license argument, argument, I think, is compelling even in the video game context. Um, it's just not reasonable to think that when you walk into the tattoo parlor and ask for the tattoo, that you're giving up your ability to be represented in a form of media. Now, again, the hangover case is a little bit different because they chose to put the tattoo on somebody else. But we're just talking about depicting the athlete in the game, in a game with a resolution that could handle those fine details and that for some players may even include those details. I think a pretty strong argument is there that it's, it's implied, even though nobody signed any papers in the tattoo parlor, they, they didn't go in with their lawyer, not surprisingly, when they got their tattoo, that uh, the implication is that this would be whatever you want to call it, implied license or fair use, um, and it would be unreasonable for the plaintiff to be able to control the realistic depiction of an athlete in a game. But it looks like this Solid Oak case, that's the one involving the NBA series, which is now going around if you want to look at it, um, I guess will be the case to give us an initial answer to the question. Is the court going to say, yeah, uh, there's an implied license or fair use? Do you want to add anything to that? No, not really. I guess the other side of that argument of the implied license might be, hey, you got to pay the piper who's creating the art, right? So they they could always go get permission, although, you know, if you ask athlete A, um, who gave you this tattoo, and who gave you that one, and who gave you all, your whole arm's worth of tattoos, 
it, it might get a little impractical. Well, and imagine the windfall you also get, because uh, if the negotiation happens before the tattoo is put on, it's going to come out very differently than if it happens later. Mm-hmm. So I walk, I'm a famous athlete. I walk into the tattoo parlor. Could I get a tattoo from you? Well, of course. I'd be thrilled to give you the tattoo. Will you... Uh, authorize me to uh, appear in all the sorts of things I normally appear in. I would expect the tattoo artist to say, sure, no problem. But now I've already got the tattoo. Now I'm showing up in the games. Now I walk into the tattoo artist and say, you know, I, I, I'd like to have this paper signed. Well, now the price goes up, right? It's like the, the cost of the settlement if you get the injunction before the big movie's about to be released. The cost now goes up. So, the question, what do you Well, let me. Uh, I was thinking about that. Um, if we let's talk first about the video game company. Basically, there's there's two ways a plaintiff could go with. If they had a timely registration of their of their copyright, they may be able. They they can go ask for statutory damages, which is a range, you know, up to thirty thousand dollars, or if it's willful, up to one hundred fifty thousand dollars for any one work. Uh, but in addition, uh, you have actual damages, which would be a lost license fee, what they normally might have licensed here, plus, and this, this is where it gets a little dangerous for the defendant, the profits of the infringer attributable to the infringement. Now, you uh, take the hangover case. Uh, you, the plaintiff can't just go in and say, this movie made $51 million the first day, uh, and I want all the profits. No, because those aren't all attributable to the infringement. So the court has to go through, or the jury, through an apportionment process. How much of those millions of dollars of profits were attributable to having the tattoo in there? Now, when we talk about the video games and demanding real-life specificity, there might be some attribution to the, to the tattoos. Here, I'll, I'll pass this around. This is the demand letter in the Solid Oak case, um, the one involving the uh, 2K series. So in the demand letter, it says, well, if you, if you go back to this case, the one involving um, uh, the UFC game, the way this eventually... Uh, ended up is that a bankruptcy court handling THQ's bankruptcy awarded the plaintiff $22,500 for the infringement represented in this game here. So in the letter it says, all right, let's look at the number of units this sold and use the $22,500 to get a number, and that's $0.55 per unit. So per game, $0.55, but then they say let's multiply that by the number of tattoos, um, so, depending on how many tattoos there are, you know, it could be a few dollars per unit, which is a fairly, I mean, if you've got hundreds of athletes and dozens and dozens and dozens of tattoos, this is very quickly going to add up to a number that makes no reasonable sense whatsoever. But that's what's in here, and I'll pass around two copies to see what's in here. And again, that's just their starting number. Obviously, they don't expect it to end up there, but... That gives you some benchmark how some of these things are coming. Uh, yes. I'm wondering, like, what if, like, you take advantage of, like, you know, a tribal tattoo on his face, and I point out that, like, that always is focused very prominently in their advertising, so his face is on a lot of, like, posters on the streets and billboards. So he, but, like, imagine if it was, like, a Batman sitting there, or, like, a Mickey Mouse. Now, the tattoo artist might not have rights really to be giving them that out, maybe, I don't know. He certainly wouldn't have rights to sign off on it. But like that, you could definitely say, I can see that being the case. You know, Ed Helms has a Mickey Mouse on his face. Clearly, Disney is not going to be able to pay that. I was actually at a entertainment law conference where the lawyers who were doing the panel, I can't remember who they uh, were with, um, some of the TV stations, but Disney lawyers were in the audience. And there was a reference to some reality show where somebody had a Mickey Mouse tattoo. Somebody on the panel said, well, of course Disney wouldn't mind this, right? And everyone kind of laughs nervously, right? Um, so we haven't had a case that raises that issue, but it's a very good question. I mean, suppose one of these athletes got a tattoo that's somebody's trademark. Well, now you're not worried so much about the tattoo artist, who may not be able to claim ownership, because the tattoo artist actually infringed. 
when the tattoo artist put the logo or copyrighted imagery on the person. But now, now it's the trademark owner or some other copyright owner. Um, what happens in a case like that? We don't, uh, we don't have any examples like that that I know of. Even complaints that have been filed, I'm not aware. No, of. I haven't seen that. But for trademark infringement, usually you have to have what we call trademark use. Use, uh, you know, uh, just a word like Apple, a very powerful trademark, just in itself, it, you know, it has no trademark rights unless somebody is trying to use it in a way as a trademark to identify the source. So if LeBron has Coke or something on there, you're not going to get trademark infringement per se, maybe a, some kind of claim of false endorsement that, you know. Hey, that sounds like a segue. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So go. <laughs> uh, were there any other questions on the copyright discussion sure, before I just, we... I just want to be clear. Does, any, does anyone on the panel not think that the implied license argument is correct for video games? And if you don't think that argument is correct, why not? I th that's, that's how I think the case should be decided. Do you think that's how the case should be decided? Um, I'd have to think more about have to think it. More. I, I, I'll go along with the professor <laughs> here. Um, do you... Um, I mean, sure. <laughs> you know, certain, yeah. I mean, I mean there's a few things that I think can be pulled apart, but. Yeah, extending it, you know, off the person and into the video game. That's where maybe yeah. I'm just not so totally sure. Well, I guess I just wonder how do you distinguish the video game from television? Most of these games scan the person to write their image. So I don't see how that's any different than taking a camera and filming them. Um, and you know, going through the you know the legal gymnastics to try and say, oh well, it's okay in a photo, which is also a fixed medium, right? also a reproduction, um, but not okay in the game. Kind of baffles me. I guess I'd be curious to hear if you think that there's a distinguishable reason video games should be treated different. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, I just haven't really thought thought it through well enough to really take a position on that. Um, so in the, the on the copy of the uh, 2K14 that you're passing around, there's an actual picture of LeBron on the front. Mm -hmm. Did they cite that as one of the copyright violations in the claim against them, or is it only for the digital image of your Uh You know, the letter is going around, and the letter mentions the cover. I'm not sure it's completely clear if they want to make a distinction and concede that the cover is acceptable. I, I don't know if they've said anything in the case that would clearly answer that question. It, 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 if they don't uh, make a claim against the cover, but do make a claim against the uh, image of him inside the game, is the distinction that an artist from 2K Sports recreated the tattoo the same as the, an artist for The Hangover recreated the tattoo on Ed Helms? Well, I, I'm not... Sh from the plaintiff's standpoint, I doubt they'd want to go down the road of making that distinction. Now, as you pointed out, we could have constructed the character in the game by filming the person. Uh, I suppose it could have been done by looking at a picture and then creating it without first filming the person. Um, I'm not sure that should make any difference. Uh, well, I guess my question is the film itself. No one on the panel thinks that the film would be a violation. You put LeBron James on camera, as he is many days of the year, mm -hmm. that's not a violation. Well, well, the idea that a court would say that after getting your tattoo, you now can't go on TV is absurd, right? That's not going to happen. So um, I don't get what the difference between that and then so now the next steps to a scan of your body, which, I mean, this is not fictional, it's like what Madden does. I don't know what they did in the 2K game, yeah. but for Madden, they scan the players. Here, so, here's why a court might come out differently. The court doesn't view video games in the same way as a film. And they just don't take it as seriously as a film. So that's one. Uh, now, I think the point about just sort of pointing the camera at things and capturing it. Imagine you're doing a scene in a film outside and you just film the street. You're going to pick up a lot of trademarks in the background, right? Uh, depending on what street it is. Are you going to go get a license from dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, companies that are in the background? Well, you might, but it's uh, probably not happening uh, in many cases. But suddenly it's a video game. Do video game publishers feel free to just film the scene and stick it into the game? No, they're going to want to clear every single one of those marks if they can, because they're a lot more nervous about litigation. Now, you know, again, that ties into the next topic, this false endorsement topic, because we're talking a little bit about trademarks here. The issues are slightly different, whether we're talking about trademarks or copyright. Um, but I think that a court might think the film should be treated differently because 
you're just sort of you're just sort of pointing the camera and grabbing it all, whereas you're building it from the ground up as a video game developer. I don't find that a compelling distinction, but you know, I think a court might. Courts have not treated video games in quite the same way as other mediums uh, in a lot of cases. Now, that's kind of changing over time, and you can find cases where they are treating games in the same way, but I think if you look at the whole, you'll see a little more skepticism about the game medium versus other mediums and not taking it seriously. Last year when I did a panel, I played this fun clip uh, where the, the judge said, uh, gosh, I think compared to a greeting card, video games don't do so well. I mean, your average greeting card is more expressive than a video game, right? I mean, think of a greeting card with one or two lines on it. That, that's more expressive than your typical video game. I mean, that, that seemed to be a serious question on the part of the judge. Um, so I, I think that reflects the lack of familiarity with the medium that a lot of judges have. I think that, that hurts in a case like this, yeah. So if I were to advise my clients, you know, one of these topics, I would recommend to one person another than to the other than 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 the other than
advising and you're representing a player, you want to be able to market this player every single avenue possible. And you, instead of you know, limiting that potential requirement of potential markets, are you sitting down with your players and saying, hey, here's the deal. Kick ass on the court today. You have to know if you're not doing this with your labor, you might lose X endorsement or you might lose X uh, it's very specific to the client, I think, but probably not. Probably not. Um, you know, again, I'm, I work with a, in a league of like 400 jobs. You know, in the NBA, there's 400 jobs. In the NFL and the MLB, there's 1,500 each. Rarely do you tell your clients how to live on something very mundane and simple like that. Now, if it's what you should be doing, you know, socially when you're on other things, sure, you know, but like you have to pick your battles. And I, guys would leave their, their agents if they told them, we want you to live this way, just to show them, no, like I'm the boss. So I wouldn't dare, you know, test my guys like that. But I could see the NFL trying to, you know, uh, you know, institute something or making guys wear sleeves to cover them up. Um, you know, that's what you had to do back in the NBA at a certain time. Now you don't have to. Um, but I, in my industry, I wouldn't tell my clients how to know. Because even if I tell them no, they're still going to go get them. Because a lot of times they're offered them for free. So, One of the stumbling blocks that I have in this issue is before we, even, like, without even going into the distinction between film and video games and how copyrights treated differently, question of whether or not the human body is even eligible for being a tangible medium of expression in terms of copyright, because if it is, then maybe tattoos are copyrightable. But if that's true, then what's next? Are haircuts going to be sculptural works? And even Talks after that, that, if we're going to be having copyrights in, in people's bodies, then can we have trademarks as well? Could Dennis Rodman have trademarked his colored hair in the mid night? Like, I've seen Conan O'Brien using his, an outline of his hair for logos on his show all the time. So, like, where do we draw the line on that? Is that something that is being addressed at all in these cases? Like, in terms of well, the far-reaching judge, implications of precedent? The judge addressed it. In your well, it, it, was, it was kind of argued. They were, the, the defendants in the hangover case were making arguments like, you know, somebody shouldn't be able to have a copyright in their body, and, and I think anyone would agree with that, um, but uh, that's a little different than saying, can a body be a tangible medium of expression? Um, uh, as far as a haircut, you know, it's got to be fixed. Uh, the fact that your hair continues to grow, and even with hairspray, I'm not sure your hair is totally fixed, but it, it, that's kind of a, um, I know it's an unusual question. Now, the Conan trademark, you, yeah, you can you can have a drawing, and if it's representing you and it's you're using it to promote yourself, I could see that some stylistic drawing of his unique hairstyle uh, could serve as a trademark. There was a case some years ago. I can't remember the statute, but it was about a flower garden here in Chicago, yeah. and they ruled that the flower garden was not fixed. Right. So a flower garden is probably a little more specific. It's not so much the beauty of the body as how long do we expect this to last? Yeah. You know, right. Is it inherently fixed or is it inherently Right. I, I would argue it's a flower garden. Right, exactly. And a lot of tattoos will start out on a piece of paper, right? So we'll draw it, it's fixed, and then we'll make an exact duplicate here. So. I mean, I'm inclined to think the judge was right in that case. I, I, I would rather go the route of saying implied license for things like this than somehow saying tattoos aren't. Yeah, I totally line. agree with that. All right, well, there are five minutes left, so let me make a plug for a case to pay attention to. So what's the tie into the right of publicity and false endorsement in this case? Suppose you had a tattoo that was closely associated with a particular individual, and that tattoo without the individual is put into a game. And uh, maybe an example of this would be a case involving the Ultimate Warrior uh, years ago, where one of the things you could do in the Create a Wrestler feature was put something like the Ultimate Warrior's face uh, design onto a wrestler. So let's say you have a tattoo. It's closely identified with somebody. You don't have permission to put the, the somebody in the game, so you say, let's just put the athlete in the game. 
Could you have a problem with that? Well, you might have two. One of the problems you might have is the one that's on the colored sheet. That's the right of publicity problem where a plaintiff says, that tattoo is a symbol of my identity. And that by putting the tattoo in the game, you have used my identity in the game without permission. That could raise a problem that we put under this general heading of the right publicity. And as I said a few minutes ago, this is still an interesting topic in the gaming medium. You can see how other mediums are dealt with in this chart here. And you can see that traditional mediums of expression are generally viewed as uh, not being liable when they depict a real person's identity. So if I'm doing a film and I put a real person into the film, I'm not likely to be liable. Now, if I put that real person into an advertisement, then I would be. But do we treat the game like the film or not? And the most recent cases have said, we kind of want to still treat the games in a way that's different than other traditional mediums, but they haven't done a good job of explaining that. So it's still an issue that is going to remain interesting. And uh, there is still a circuit split, in my opinion, on this issue that at some point should get the Supreme Court's attention. But the other sort of claim you might get is where the athlete says, you used my easily identifiable tattoo in the game, and that's going to make people think I endorsed the game. So now you've got a false endorsement claim. False endorsement claims often go along with the right of publicity claim. And this is an interesting topic. There is an interesting case pending that I would encourage you to pay attention to. If you look at page three of the handout on false endorsement, there's a case from 2015 called Virag. And it's currently on appeal before the Ninth Circuit, and it involves this issue because Sony, in its Gran Turismo games, the most recent ones, showed a trademark in the game, and they didn't get permission from the trademark owner, and the trademark owner sued. And the Ninth Circuit had a case not too long ago they very clearly stood for the proposition that the defendant should win. This is a medium of expression. It's not an advertisement, even though it's a video game. So here was a court treating video games in the same way as other mediums. The court said, uh, we're going to treat video games in the same way. And if you depict a mark in a traditional medium of expression, it's not an advertisement, it's not commercial speech, then you have a First Amendment right to do so. But then this Virag case comes along, and even though the Virag case does agree with that, it has some what we call dicta, there's a little bit of free language in there, that refers back to an earlier case that didn't come out that way. And the judge suggested that there's still some vitality left to that earlier case. And so, we have this Virag case on appeal now before the Ninth Circuit. And it's going to force the Ninth Circuit to clear up some of the confusion the Ninth Circuit itself created in its own opinions about the First Amendment right of video game producers to pick marks in their work. And uh, there's no oral argument set yet. Uh, I checked the docket just an hour and a half ago. Um, but when they finally have an oral argument in this case, you should be able to watch it on YouTube and hear some of these issues discussed. Because it's a very important issue. And it's back to that one you mentioned, uh, you know, I, I want to depict a, lands a realistic landscape. I want to do the same thing a TV producer would do when I'm going to film a car driving down the street. I want to get the background. And I do that as a video game producer, because in the background there's a Chevron station and a Wendy's and McDonald's. And, you know, a TV show could likely show that and probably would not be sued. And even if they were, they'd likely win. Can the video game producer do it also? So it's a pretty important question. Can we do the same thing that other mediums can do? And I think this case, the Virag one, uh, given that the plaintiff here is pressing this older case I alluded to, that older case is called Textron, I think the Ninth Circuit is going to really have to be clear this time. And um, they're going to have to say, do you really have the ability, as a video game producer, to put a trademark in the work and successfully claim First Amendment protection to do so even if you don't have and um, you know, that won't settle things nationwide, but if you look at the chart, you'll see the gist of these cases is that if a mark is shown in non-commercial speech, book, film, TV show, newspaper article, something like that, defendants generally win. But there's still a question about what we're going to do with video games, and you can see in, in at least one of the rare cases where somebody loses, it is this Textron video game case, there's also this Ultimate Creations case that's in the chart. That's the one involving the Ultimate Warrior. Um, there, there is one outlier case where uh, a film defendant loses. Um, well, actually, a couple. 
there's an outlier magazine case. But the trend of the cases is defendants win these things when it's a false endorsement claim. Uh, so, I don't know, final thoughts in the remaining two minutes. We've got a lot of issues we could have talked about right after listening to false endorsement a lot longer. But do you have any yeah. thoughts on this half of the subject matter? Uh, not really. Okay. What, what about you, uh, Ed? Any thoughts on this in terms of dealing with clients and writing list issues? And yeah, I mean, um, I would I would look out for it uh, on behalf of my clients, but just going back to the other question, like I would never tell my guys what to do or what not to do, <laughs> but I could see, you know, unless things get tightened up and cleared, I could see there, you know, continuing to be issues. Last time when we spoke, I myself brought up the haircut, you know, example, I'm like, uh, it's stretching it too far, you know, but again, unless, you know, there's some clear... Um, you know, headway, which it doesn't seem like there is because, um, you know, and I think you made a really good point when you said a lot of the, you know, judges making uh, decisions on this didn't grow up, you know, playing video games. They just don't understand the difference. And I think as time goes on, it'll become easier as, you know, younger people, you know, get into those, um, you know, positions. Um, but again, I, I could see, you know, the obvious, you know, issues and where, you know, kind of, you know, the different sides may lay. As an agent, are you as excited as I am when a case like Virag goes up on appeal, checking the docket every day to find out when you can actually get some insight into what the court? I didn't even do? know what Virag was before you mentioned it. So. <laughs> All right, any final questions? Are we good? I think we're at time, right? We're at time. Okay, well, uh, final words. Do you have anything to say? Final words. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming out today, sticking with us through six whole panels. I hope you all have learned a lot and met some cool people a little bit about video game law, and I hope you all come back next year when we do this again, and hopefully some of our speakers will as well. Uh, so if you can just take a minute to help me thank our speakers, and hopefully we'll all see you out there.